Next speaker is um, is uh, Car uh, Cesar Esteban. Uh, he is traveling in this moment, and uh, he is in a in a plane, and then it was impossible to contact with him. And uh, he offered us the uh, the PowerPoint by uh, a video, and uh, I suggest that uh, Beatrice uh, can uh, use this video. I uh, will try. Uh, I will uh, try, Rosa. <laughs> In order to explain the journey that was uh, very important for all of us because it was the first, the first uh, trip around the world. They yes. uh, take a, a ship and they were the first people that uh, live from Spain and back to Spain after two years. Uh, they leave three ships and arrive only one. And then the, the, really that show that the, that the difficulty was very important. And they use the method that you know in order to determine their latitude. Okay. Uh, it was a method used by uh, navigators in this moment, in the in this century, in the 16th century, and was normally used for Portuguese and Spanish navigators, okay? Then I think that, uh, Beatriz, are you yes. ready? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Rosa Maria, for giving the opportunity to collaborate in this educative project. In this presentation, I will talk about the use of astronomy to navigate at the beginning of the 17th century, at the time of the first voyage around the world in two different geographical areas, Europe and Oceania. The first circumnavigation around the Earth was made by the Magellan Elcano expedition. It took place between 1519 and 1522. It was sponsored by the Spanish King Charles I, aiming to find a route sailing westward to the Spice Islands, initially led by the Portuguese sailor Fernando de Magalhães and completed by the Spanish Juan Sebastián Elcano. It is considered one of the most important events in history for its scientific, economic, political, philosophical, and even theological consequences. The Magellan and Cano expedition lasted three years and traveled 70,000 kilometers, many of them through unknown seas to European sailors. Five ships and a crew of 243 men started a journey, but only 18 of them returned to a single ship, the Victoria, led by Juan Sebastián Elcano. One of the most important members of the ship's crew was the pilot, the third in rank of the crew. The pilot had knowledge of astronomy, mathematics, cosmography, and had the responsibility to determine the position, the two coordinates, latitude and longitude of the point of the Earth that the ship was in, in, in each moment, the velocity of the ship and the distance traveled during, during the journey, and stay the cars. For staying the cars, the European pilots of the time had the magnetic compass. To estimate the velocity and distance, they used a combination of two very simple instruments, a sunglass to measure the time and a chip lock to measure the distance traveled by the ship in the duration of the period of time measured by the sunglass. This is the origin that we use the word not to, determine, to give the, the, the velocity of a ship. The longitude was impossible to determine with the technology of the 17th century. It was not until the use, well, the invention, invention and the use of mechanical clocks in, in the ships at the beginning of the 19th century, very uh, after, uh, several centuries after the, the Magellan Elcano expedition. In, at, at this moment, with a, having a, a mechanical clock, we can determine the absolute time uh, along the trip and we can determine the longitude with enough precision. In the European ships of the time, in the 17th century, there were two methods for determining the latitude. 
One, the first one from measuring the height, height or altitude of the pole star above the horizon. Another one that is the, the method that we will use in this project is to measure the height of the sun or the altitude of the sun above the horizon when crossing the ship's meridian. There were several instruments for measuring height and altitudes at the time. One of them was the Astrolab, another the Quadrant, and the third one the Jacob's Staff. This is a scheme of one of the instruments, of these instruments, the Quadrant, probably the one used in the Magellan Elcano expedition. It was a simplified version of the Astrolab and easier to, to use. And it, have, it has two sides on the edge, edges of one of the straight of the straight sides of the quadrant with which the pilot aligned one of his eyes with the sun of the star or a star. The height or the altitude of the star of the sun was indicated by the intersection between the vertical line defined by the hanging, a hanging plumb bob and the graduated circle that the quadrant has in his carpet side, <laughs> its circular side. The typical a large number of measurements made by modern replicas of quadrants on ships of the Portuguese Navy, made by Pereira, find that the typical error on the determination of latitude was of the order of 17 minutes of arc, something less than one third of, the, of a degree. That corresponds to an error of about 29 kilometers in the position of the ship. Let's come back to the Magellan expedition. Uh, this expedition were the first passing through the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. In fact, they discovered and crossed the Strait of Magellan during 36 days. From October 21st to November 28th of 1520. The notes of one of the pilots of the expedition, Francisco Albo, during the days of the passage of the strait, indicate an error of 20 minutes of arc, about one third of degree, in his measurements of latitude. This translates into an uncertainty of about only 35 kilometers in the position of the ship. One important moment of the Magellan Elcano expedition was the crossing of the equator after three months of sailing, more or less in the, in, in the middle of the ocean between the African and American or Brazilian coasts. Crossing the equinox, they lose the vision of the pole star and they, the sailors and the pilots of the, of the expedition lose one of the most important ways to determine, to determine the, the, the latitude that was the observation of the pole star. Uh, since, since then, they had to, uh, to measure the latitude only by uh, observations of the position of the sun. There was uh, the most important uh, account of the voyage was made by Antonio de Pigafetta, an Ital Italian uh, member of the crew, one of the, the 18th uh, survivors that, uh, that came back to Seville in 1522. The southern sky is quite different from the northern sky. The area around the South Pole is empty of bright stars. Pigafetta also tells us about 
the presence of two small clouds or nebulae close to the South Pole. Later, these objects will be known as the Magellanic Clouds. The Magellanic Clouds are really two small galaxies located at about 200,000 light years that are satellites of our Milky Way. Pigafetta also describes the constellation of the Southern Cross. It was described by the Greeks but forgotten in medieval times in Europe. The people of the Magellan Elcano expedition were the first European to sail in the Pacific Ocean. In fact, they were who put it the name Pacific. They, they were 100 days without making any landfall by a completely unknown ocean for the Europeans. The first landfall was in the small island of Guam, in the Mariana Islands, the first contact between Europeans and Oceanians in history. As the Europeans of the expedition, the inhabitants of the Pacific Islands were skilled navigators. The different islands of the Pacific were settled from Southeast Asia in different moments between 2000 BC to 1000 AD. Traditional canoes and navigation methods are still in use in the atolls of the Caroline Islands. The Caroline Islands are close to the equator, in the country we know now as Federated States of Micronesia. On the other hand, we can see here that most of the islands of the Pacific Ocean are included in the tropical band, limited by the Tropic of Cancer in the north and Tropic of Capricorn in the south the navigation by the stars in this geographical area. In fact, a star close to the horizon, when it is in its rising or setting, may be used as an indicator of a sailing direction. Near the equator, when a star here, when a star rises or sets, it does so in a path almost perpendicular to the horizon. So its position can be used as a sailing direction for several hours. This does not happen at high latitudes, such as most of Europe, because the, the position of a star of the sun changes its position with respect to the north, and it cannot be trusted as an accurate sailing direction. The Carolinian navigators used the so-called sidereal compass. It consists of 32 points defined by the rising and setting points of 15 bright stars of constellations. The navigators consider this the best method for navigating and the preferred one for indicating accurate sailing directions. The navigators are the Islanders with the highest social status in the Carolan atolls. After long years of training in the canoe houses, they memorize the different stellar directions that can be used between each pair of known islands and study other information useful for navigating, such as currents, winds, clouds, birds, they can navigate and keep a direction, even identifying a single star. They acquire a complete knowledge of the sky. The traditional navigators use other techniques. They use the position of the sun, a rising at setting during the day. They use also the magnetic compass, a secondary method for determining the direction, but only after the contact with the Europeans. They use many other techniques, as the soil steering, the study of the appearance, appearance of the clouds over the islands, and many others. As a proof of their strong relation with the ocean, the people of the atolls of the Central Caroline Islands call themselves the people of the open sea. They do not consider the ocean as an obstacle 
but a link of communication between the small island worlds where they live. So we can see both European and Pacific Island sailors had something in common, something that had to do with the sky and the stars. And that's all. Thank you very much.